Well, Merry Christmas. This is my favorite service because it's the last one, but really because you all already had dinner, haven't you? And you're not hung, a hangry at me going, hurry it up. So I'm going to take my time. No, I'm joking. I'll get you out of here. Thank you for being here. Welcome. My name is Troy. Thanks for joining us. And thank you for all, all your support this last year and being able to help so many people around the world and bring joy and hope to those folks. And so this is my Christmas message. Are you ready? Okay, well, I've been thinking this week, and uh, I realize, I think I know what some of you have been thinking. I think I know what you've been thinking, and here it is. Is it true? Is it true? I think a lot of people nowadays struggle to believe in Christmas. Um, I think uh, maybe you're here tonight, and maybe you struggle to believe in Christmas, and the reason that you don't believe is, is probably a good reason because you're a smart person, but, you know, maybe it's just, a, it's just too unbelievable for you. It's too fantastical, too far out there, and you're not alone. Like I said, I think uh, a lot of people kind of wrestle with this question, is it true? Is it true? Now, personally, I love this question. I love it. Uh, If you've attended here before, you know that this is one of my favorite things to talk about. And specifically, and especially, this one little word that's on the inside of it. It. Is it true? I love talking about it. Now, some of you are like, what is it? Well, um, for some people, it is the Bible. They're like, you know... Bible, it's hard for me, you know. I mean, nowadays, there's just been a lot of criticism. People, you know, you go to college and they tell you, and you're just like, I wonder, is the Bible true, right? And and I think that a lot of people uh, believe that they have to believe in the Bible in order to believe in Jesus. But here's the thing, here's the truth. There were hundreds of thousands of Christians before there was ever one Bible, That's reality, yeah. Uh, The books and the letters that have been collected and compiled and put in, before they were ever collected and compiled and put into one group in the Bible, um, was, uh, it was around 400 A.D. I mean, uh, Christianity by that time was spreading all over the world and had been spreading for centuries before the Bible ever came into existence. And so, contrary to popular opinion, uh, the Bible didn't create Christianity, it's the other way around, right? And, and so if, or so the it that you're wrestling with shouldn't be, is the Bible true? It's another it. It's a different it. And that's important to know, especially if um, the Bible is the reason that you walked away from faith, all right? And so that's a topic for another day. I'm not going to dig into it anymore. But I would suggest to you a better question to ask tonight, and that is, is, is the story of Jesus true? That's a better question because, I mean, the question is, is are the circumstances surrounding Jesus' life and death and resurrection true, right? That's the crux of the issue. If that really happened, then it changes everything. I mean, this whole world has been turned upside down on us because of that. And one of the most amazing things uh, to me about the story of Jesus, get this, is that everyone who was involved in the story or who was involved in bringing us the story, um, they struggled with their faith. They all doubted. Every one of them doubted. Every one of them uh, believed at one time and then disbelieved. Every one of the disciples uh, followed Jesus and then at some point they unfollowed Jesus, right? Um, Every one of those people wrestled with the question, is it true? And one of the things I love about this is that they were honest about their doubt. They didn't try to hide it or cover it up. Um, In fact, I would suggest to you that their transparency about their doubts underscores the trustworthiness of their claims, right? I mean, in other words, their willingness to admit that they doubted, it kind of helps me believe what they said. I like that. And of course, they doubted. I mean, the, the story was too, almost too unbelievable to believe. It was otherworldly when you think about it. I mean, think about it. Uh, the creator of the universe uh, came to earth 
as a human being so that we could understand what he's really like and what he really wants for us. Man, I mean, that's just, that's too good to be true. <laughs> and, and speaking of good, this is interesting. We are told early on in the Christmas story that it was good news, that, that the coming of Jesus was good news um, of great joy for all people. But here's the reality. For some of us here tonight, um, our doubt has convinced us that the story isn't true, and so we've kind of opted out, we've kind of checked out on this. And here's what you and I need to remember. We need to remember this, that from the very beginning of this story, we can see that God loved and God used imperfect, doubting people to change the world. Literally. I mean, uh, he didn't use perfect, faith-filled people. He used imperfect, doubt-filled people. That was the pattern. And that, my friend, is good news for all of us here. In other words, regardless of whether you believe or you used to believe or um, you never believed, um, the good news here tonight is that you can still be a part of this Christmas story. You can still be a part of it. Uh, doubt doesn't disqualify you from following Jesus. Now, doubt may disqualify you from being a good religious person, and doubt might disqualify you from being a, a good member of your church or of the church that you grew up in, which you eventually left, but doubt doesn't disqualify you from knowing and following Jesus. And it never has. It never has. And so tonight, what I want to do is I want to tell you the Christmas story again. And my hope is, is that in spite of your doubt, um, you will allow yourself to ask this question again. Is it true? Is the story of Jesus true? And if you can answer that, then perhaps maybe we can ask ourselves an even more qu important question, and that is, is it good? Is Christmas good news for me and you. Now, uh, before we get to that, uh, what I want to do is I want to look at this story with a, a fresh set of eyes. And what I want to do is I want to start by looking at Dr. Luke. Luke um, uh, is the, probably the person who gave us the most detailed account of that very first Christmas. And I love Luke. Uh, I love Luke because at the beginning of his account, he makes several interesting statements. For example, he says this, many people... Many people. Now, let me just ask you, ask you a quick question. How many is many? Four? Forty? Four hundred? I don't know. But I know this. Many is more than a few. Can we agree on that? Right. Okay. So Luke says this. He says, many people have set out to write an account of the things that have happened among us. Now, what he's talking about here is he's talking about Jesus. And he's saying, listen, uh, many people, people like Matthew or Mark, or many others have taken the time and the expense to hire someone to write down what they saw or write down what happened. Now, you need to understand, back then, uh, that wasn't an easy thing to do, and, and it was very expensive to do that. I mean, that was, that was not regular. I mean, nowadays, it's no big deal for someone to write a story or write a novel or write a biography. I mean, it's inexpensive and it's easy. But back then, it cost a lot of money to hire a scribe because no one could, hardly anybody could read or write back then, and to hire a scribe and to go out and investigate and write someone's life story, which begs the question, why? Why, <laughs> why did so many people according to Luke, spend some time and some money to document the life story of a poor rabbi from nowhere. I mean, this guy never probably traveled more than 20 miles from his hometown. And he was only really in the public eye for maybe three or four years. Why would people want to know about him? The answer is simple. It's because something happened. Something happened. And I would suggest to you it was something good that happened. Something good. And, and by the way, uh, listen, I don't know what version of Christianity you grew up with, but if it didn't sound good to you when you heard it, it probably wasn't true. 
I'm telling you, the original version of Christianity was so good that people wanted to hear it and they wanted to believe it even though it was hard to believe. That's the reality. So Luke goes on. He says, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I have also decided to write an accurate account for you, most excellent Theophilus. He's writing this to a guy by the name of Theophilus. Now, historians, we're not really sure who... Theophilus was. Our best guess is that he was a wealthy man who was curious about the things that he'd heard about Jesus, and he wanted to hear the story from the very beginning to the end. And so he hired a Greek physician by the name of Luke. And Luke uh, was a learned man. He could read and write. And he hired him to go out and investigate and to talk to anyone who had any contact with Jesus. And Luke says this. He says, I've done this, Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have heard. You're here tonight and you're like, is it true? Luke says, what you're about to hear is. He checked it out, double checked it. And I want you to just remember some interesting tidbit before we get into this. Remember, Luke had no idea that what he was writing for one person would one day end up being shared all over the world for millions and millions of persons just like tonight. He had no idea. And so Luke uh, kind of starts out his story about the birth of Jesus, not with who you would imagine, Mary and Joseph. He starts out with two people that you and I would have never heard about if Luke never told us about him. He introduces us to an elderly Jewish priest by the name of Zechariah and his elderly wife named Elizabeth. And, uh, and he tells us something that's intimate about them, that's maybe private. He tells us that Luke, I mean, Zechariah and, and Elizabeth were barren, that they were childless, and that they had tried having children for years and years and years, and now that they're old, they've slowly maybe become convinced that God had forgotten them. But Luke tells us that this year, Zechariah gets a blessing. Yeah, um, it's interesting. You may not know this. Zechariah was one of 18,000 Jewish priests who worked at the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. I mean, he's this large group, and, and that was his job. And through a lottery system, Zechariah, get this, was chosen to be the one person who would go into the Holy of Holies and make a sacrifice. Now, if you don't know much about this, the Holy of Holies was just this little room at the center of the temple, and it was a very important room. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was. It was like this thing, and no one could go in there. No one was in there except once a year, they would send one priest in there to go make a sacrifice, and this year, it's Zachariah's turn. It's a huge honor. I mean, this is probably, uh, professionally, this is the best day of Zachariah's life. But according to uh, Luke, it was about to get better. <laughs> Luke says that while Zechariah was in the Holy of Holies making the sacrifice all by himself, the angel Gabriel appeared to him. Now, uh, uh, Luke tells us that Zechariah became afraid and he fell to the ground, which is totally consistent with everything that we ever heard about anybody running into an angel. Anytime someone ran into an angel, they peed their pants and they fell to the ground, right? They freaked out. I mean, it's scary. It was terrifying. In fact, people sometimes tell me, Pastor, I think I saw an angel. I'm like, did you pee your pants and fall to the ground? They're like, no, that was probably an angel then, man, because it's, 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 it's a psychotic thing. And so uh, he, he falls to the ground and he's afraid, and Gabriel says something to him. He says, do not be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayers have been heard. You and your wife will soon have a son, and you should name him John, and he will be great. Now, Zechariah has no idea that his son John would grow up to become John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest man who ever lived. Um, this, this is incredible news. This is, this is unbelievable. This is great news for Zechariah. But I want you to watch how he responds. <laughs> he says, uh, how, how can I be sure of this? How is God going to do this? How is this possible? Like, right? He doubts. He doubts the angel. Uh, why? Because I'm telling you, everyone uh, struggled with believing this when it happened. And the angel is a little put, put off. He's like, Zachariah, listen, man, I am Gabriel. 
The angel, I'm standing here in the presence of the Lord with you, man. Dude, an angel is talking to you right here in the holiest place on earth, in the holies of holies. And why should you doubt this? And uh, Zechariah kind of catches himself and he's like, okay. He, he tries to explain. He's like, okay, well, um, I am an old man and my wife is, and he catches himself. He's like, and my wife is well along in years. <laughs> I mean, he may be old, but he ain't stupid, right? He, that's a great adjustment. And, uh, and, but my point is, is that Zachariah doubted this amazing news that he was hearing. I mean, he couldn't figure it out in his little mind how God could possibly do this. And I think a lot of us do the same thing. How can God possibly do this? How can God possibly do this, do Christmas? Well, the angel <laughs> uh, says to him, listen, Zach, because you've doubted, uh, you're not going to be able to speak for a while. <laughs> but listen to me, God still loves you, and God wants to use you in spite of your doubt. God will still use you even if you're a doubter. So, story goes on, Luke continues, he says, in the sixth month, six months later, the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to a town in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin pledged to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of King David. And the virgin's name was, does anybody know? That was pretty weak. One more time. Mary. Mary. I mean, that's not even like a trivia question. I mean, it's so easy, right? And that's kind of remarkable when you think about it. I mean, think about that. 2,000 years ago, eh, something happened in some obscure corner of the world. And it happened to someone that we probably should have never, ever heard about. And yet, almost everyone in this room and almost everyone in the world knows who the mother of Jesus is. I mean, that's odd. How did that happen? Well, Luke tells us. The angel came to Mary and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. And the same thing. Of course, Mary was troubled by what she was seeing and hearing, and she's freaking out, and she's thinking to herself, how, how am I on God's radar at all? I'm just this poor teenager from a poor town in a poor nothing country. How would God even know about me? And the angel says to her, Listen, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You are going to conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. Now, we know that that's true. That's true. That's what happened. We know that's true. I mean, here we are 2,000 years later, and we're celebrating her son's birthday because people still believe that he's the Son of God. I mean, you and I, we, if we could go back into time... Go back in that first century and meet with Mary. We'd probably say, Mary, listen, you're not going to believe this, but 2,000 years from now, uh, people are still going to be uh, talking about and thinking about and singing about your son, right? I mean, of course, there are some people who are going to struggle to believe this, but about two-thirds of, uh, 2,000 years from now, two-thirds of the world's population actually believes that he's the son of God. And Mary would probably say, well, that's... That's what the angel said would happen. And he told me that was going to happen. And she'd probably add that the angel told her that her son would also be known as a great king, and get this, and that his kingdom would never end. That he would not disappear into the pages of history ever. He would be around forever. I mean, that is, I don't know about you, that's a powerful piece of evidence right there. I mean, think about this. Luke wrote this account, they say, around 60 A.D., that's when he wrote these words. That's about 1,963 years ago. How could Luke even begin to predict the impact that Jesus would have on our world over these last 2,000 years? I mean, that was a huge claim. His kingdom, his name would never disappear. That had, it makes me wonder if Luke kind of doubted it. It's like his kingdom will never end. That's, how is that? But you know what? Even Jesus' own mother doubted this. I mean, look at this. In verse 34, it says, Mary said, how? How will this happen? 
How is this possible? How can God do this? Right? I'm not even married. The angel answers her. He says, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Then the angel goes on. Even your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, he's not as diplomatic as Zechariah was, right? (laughs) Says, who was barren. She has also conceived a son. Now get this, all you modern day doubters, Listen to the last words that the angel tells Mary. He says, for nothing will be impossible with God. And why why should anything be impossible to God? I mean, when you think about it, if God is the creator of all things, he created everything you see, I touch, feel, how would anything be impossible to him, including this story and doing this thing? So, I love Mary's response to it. Uh, It's perfect. Uh, You you know, Mary didn't get all of the answers that she had to all of her questions, right? Um, The angel didn't tell her everything. He didn't tell her how this whole thing was going to unfold for her or how she would even navigate telling her family and her fiancé how she got pregnant. (laughs) But instead of, listen to me, instead of letting her doubt totally knock her out, she simply accepted what she heard. She's like, okay, okay, let it, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me as you've just said. In other words, I don't, I don't know how this is all going to work, and I don't have to know how this all is going to work. All I know is that I've heard enough and I've seen enough to believe that God might be doing something here, and you know what? I want to get on this train before it leaves the station. Luke then tells us that the angel leaves her. Why? Well, (laughs) he needed to talk to one more person. He needed to talk to Joseph, right? And at some point, uh, Joseph had noticed that Mary was with child. She was pregnant. And in his mind, he had decided that he was going to divorce her. Because, I mean, really, what other choice was there? I mean, how could he marry such an unfaithful woman? And regardless of the story that she told him about how it happened, he could not and he would not believe such a thing could ever happen. I mean, and who could blame him? He doubted her. But because he was a good man, and perhaps maybe because he loved her, um, he decided to divorce her quietly, not to bring any shame upon her. But before he did that, an angel appeared to him in a dream. And and the angel told him not to doubt Mary. And this is interesting. I don't know if you ever caught this. This is interesting. In the dream, the angel quoted an obscure ancient Jewish scripture to persuade Joseph to stick with it. The angel quotes Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, which was, by the way, written 750 years before this night. (laughs) <laughs> it's crazy. And, and the interesting thing is that this little passage, people had read it, and no one really understood what it meant. I mean, no one ever really understood. It never, this passage, this little verse, never really made sense to anyone until this moment. Isaiah said, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. Now, Joseph knew what Emmanuel meant. It meant God with us. And uh, he might not have fully understood everything that God was going to do through this child, but when Joseph woke up, um, most of his doubts were gone. He married her, and he decided to help her protect and raise this boy. Okay, here's my point. Time and time again, in spite of people's doubts, God still loved them and use them to accomplish his plan for the world. Doubt didn't put him out. Some, I don't, it, it just God loved to use people that were filled with doubt. And I don't know the, how this happened, but some way, somehow, somewhere uh, over the years, Christianity has kind of become an all or nothing proposition. You either believe it all or you don't. And if you don't, then you can't really participate. You can't be a part of what's going on because you don't believe it all. 
But I'm telling you, that runs contrary to everything that we know about Jesus and his message. In fact, Jesus said at one time, he said, listen, if you only have the faith as small as a mustard seed, um, you can still play a part and play a role in this upside down kingdom that I'm bringing to the world. And so that brings me back to that original question that we asked at the beginning. Is it true? Is it true? And I just want you, as you think about that, is it true? I just want to ask yourself, is there a part of you, even a small part, that tells you that it might, might be true? I mean, uh, maybe, maybe a better way to put it, maybe a better question would be, uh, do you hope it's true? Right? I mean, I would think that you would hope it's true. I mean, don't you kind of hope deep down inside that this crazy, unbelievable story that, you know, you believed as a kid but you don't believe anymore might actually be true? I, I, I mean, you and I think about this. I know human nature. When you and I hear bad news, um, we instinctively hope that it's not true. Right? When we hear something bad, we're like, oh, I hope that's not true. I mean, if Netflix doubled their, their subscription rate tonight, You'd be like, oh, I hope that's not true. Or if Amazon told us all of a sudden, you know what, we're going to go back to just selling books. No more stuff. Some of you ladies are like, no, I hope that's not true. Me too. I like getting my stuff delivered. Um, but you know what? We, when, when we hear bad news, we hope it's not true. But in the same way, when we hear good news, whenever we hear good news, we kind of hope it's true, right? Like, Yeah. And, and, and I, I realize that just because something sounds good doesn't make it necessarily true. I'm just saying that when you and I hear good news, there's something inside of us that makes us kind of want to lean in and lean on that and to hope that it's true. And so here's the deal. Um, when the birth of Christ was first announced to this world, it was described as good news. That's right. It was described as good news of great joy for all people. Not, 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 it wasn't good just for religious people or churchy people, <laughs> but for all people. Uh, Jews and uh, Gentiles and Romans and Samaritans and sinners and doubters, all of us. My last question that I have for you tonight is this. If you fit in any of these categories, <laughs> let me just ask you a question. Why would you push back on this story? Why would you push back? Why would you resist the urge to at least hope that this was true? Why would you do that? I mean, when you hear good news, don't you at least want it to be true? Don't you? I know I do. I know I do. <laughs> Let me read to you the last part of this story, the rest of the story, and then maybe we can pray together, and then you can go home, sleep tight. I want to read this from uh, Luke chapter 2. It starts in verse 1. Luke says this. He says, In those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered for a census. This was the first census um, when Quirinius was a governor of Syria. I got to get bigger print here. Okay. The point I'm, you might point out here is that you notice Luke has given us some details. He's telling us, some, hey, you can look this up. This isn't once upon a time in a land far, far away. Maybe they never existed. He's like, you can check this out. Check, fact check me, he says. And he says this, that all, everybody went to be registered to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And he went to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. 
And that tells us, Luke says that in the same region, he probably interviewed these people, there were some shepherds that were out in the field, and they were keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were filled with terror. And the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. I love that. I love that. And he says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign. Okay? And, and boy, I'm sure the shepherds are like, ooh, a sign from God. It could be scary. Yeah, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. <laughs> That's the most least intimidating thing in the world. That's approachable by any of us. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of angels praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill among those with whom God is pleased. When the angels went away from them, the shepherds then said to one another, hey, let's go over to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw him, they told, uh, they made it known, <laughs> the story that had been told them concerning this child. And everyone who heard this story was amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, she treasured these things in her heart, and she pondered on them many times. And then the shepherds returned back to their fields, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told to them just as it's being told to you tonight. Merry Christmas. Would you stand? We can pray. We'll close. Yeah. Hmm. Let me just pray real quick, and then we'll conclude with a song. Heavenly Father, um, I don't know where that story lands on everyone but I pray that you would give courage to everyone to receive it as it's been given. We've been told this is the truth. We've been told that it is true. Now, for those of us who believe, I pray that you would help us find great joy in that and that you would help us to recognize all the things that God did and the links that he went to to save us. And those of us who are here that are say, well, you know what, Pastor Troy, I used to believe, but you know what, life has kind of squeezed that out of me. And slowly but surely over the years, I have drifted away from it. I pray that something would happen this Christmas to you that would infuse a sense of curiosity and it would cause you to step into this story once again and rediscover for yourself how amazing Jesus is. Not Christianity, not church, not religion. How amazing Jesus is. Father, this Christmas, I pray that you would open our hearts and open our eyes to see what perhaps we've never seen before or maybe have never seen in a long time. Help us to believe again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.